words, we are an ever-evolving community of visionaries, dreamers, and doers who have been called by God to called to live, I've been saying this for years, called to live the life you were created to live because so many of us find ourselves living a life that is not our own. Some of us have to strain to live an authentic life that is unique to us and not give in or capitulate to the expectations of people around us, but to live deeply and authentically knowing that our authenticity is our superpower. Then commanded to love beyond the limits of our prejudices means that where prejudice exists in you, where bias exists in you, when you draw a line, you cross that line and understand that love is the underlying ethos of the Jesus movement. And then no one is here unto themselves. That your service, you know the adage, so many people said it, your service is the rent you pay for the space you occupy on this planet. And so we give. And so our core values at FCBC are live, love, serve. But at FCBC, you know how we say it. We live, we love, we serve. Excellent, excellent. Listen, we'll take a seat for two minutes. I'm going to have you step back up in a minute. But many of you know that this year is a year where our mantra, our theme is I am a disciple. Because in my view, and I've shared this many times, that so often Christianity is shaped by so many things and tragically it is not always shaped by the teachings of Jesus. But Jesus reminds us in Matthew 28 that we are to make disciples. Disciples is a great word to say students, that we are to replicate ourselves, go and make disciples. And how do we make disciples? We baptize and then we teach. Jesus said, teach what I taught you. And that's where sometimes we fall short. We love teaching about Jesus, but not teach what Jesus taught. And there's a fundamental difference because those are the words that give life and empower us. So this year, our theme, I am a disciple, is making a declaration that we are disciples first. We're honoring the mandate of Jesus at the same time. Amen. All right. I told you I was going to give you a quick break. Stand back up. <laughs> All right. Listen, there's a scripture I want to share today uh, found in the Gospel of John, the fifth chapter, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, an amazing story, a beautiful story in many ways, but <clears throat> I'm reading quite a few verses, but you can, you can take it. John 5, beginning at verse 1, and I'm reading from the Message Bible. Um, and here's how it reads. Soon after, another feast came around, and Jesus was back in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem. There was a pool in Hebrew called Bethesda with five alcoves. Hundreds of sick people, blind, crippled, paralyzed, were in these alcoves. One man had been an invalid there for 38 years. When Jesus saw him stretched out by the pool and knew how long he had been there, he said, do you want to get well? Or in the King James Version, wilt thou be made whole? I love that language. <laughs> the sick man said, sir, when the water is stirred, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. By the time I get there, somebody else is already in. Jesus said, get up, take your bedroll, start walking. The man was healed on the spot. He picked up his bedroll and walked off. The day happened to be the Sabbath. The Jews stopped the healed man and said, it's the Sabbath. You can't carry your bedroll around. It's against the rules. But he told them, the man who made me well told me to. He said, take your bedroll and start walking. They asked, who gave you the order to take it up and start walking? But the healed man didn't know, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. Amen, beloved. Come on, let's, let's pray. God, we bless your name on today. We honor you, O Lord, for this season and for this time. God, you are a wonder to our souls, and we are grateful. The truth is, O God, if we had 10,000 tongues, it wouldn't be enough to express the depth of gratitude that we have towards you and for you. But God, with what we have, we say thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for being a redeemer. Thank you. Thank you for being a healer. Thank you. 
Thank you for being a restorer, a deliverer. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for how you've been showing up in our lives in ways we can't fully comprehend at all times. But, God, we know that your presence is more than enough. More than enough. We love you, God. We honor you, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. And we say, amen. 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 I want to just lift up and remain standing with me. I just want to lift up um, verse 6. When Jesus saw him stretched out by the pool and knew how long he had been there, he said, do you want to get well? Do me a favor. Just turn to your neighbor. Just tell him, neighbor, it's time. Come on, tell your other neighbor. Tell him, neighbor, it's time. Now put your hands together. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. You take the seat. It is time. This scene always amazes me because of the multiple contradictions present in that space. We're told from the beginning that this pool, this place where they are gathered is named Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy. But if you look at this scene, the house of mercy doesn't seem too merciful. For there around those five porches, those five alcoves at Bethesda, it says was a gathering of the broken, the withered, the lame, those who were struggling and hurting. There gathered at the house of mercy, it would make sense that those who are wounded and damaged and hurting would gather in at the place known for mercy. But then something happens at this place, this house of mercy. It says this, that once a year, the waters around that pool would begin to be troubled. And the story was, and the belief was, and the mythology around the pool of Bethesda was, that whoever got to the water first would be healed of whatever issue, whatever sickness, whatever ailment, whatever, whatever affliction they had. And I need you to capture that. Whoever got to the pool first when the water started troubling would be healed. Here they were at the house of mercy, but mercy was based on competitiveness. Whoever got there first which means that if you were in a real bad way, if you were really broken, if you were really damaged, you came there possibly year after year knowing full well that the possibility would, more than likely, that you would leave the same way you came. At the house of mercy, let me say it again, didn't seem very merciful when only those who weren't so damaged could make it there first. And you know, in that same house of mercy at Bethesda's pool, there wasn't kind of the thought of this communal action towards communal healing because everyone who came there was hoping that that year they would be the one who would be healed. And you've got to see that scene. People will be sitting there around Bethesda's pool waiting for the waters to start moving, waiting for the waters, as they would say, would be troubled. And as soon as the water started to move a little bit, the people started making a beeline for the water, hoping every year that they would be the first one to enter that pool, to enter that water, to get that healing and so you know that the house of mercy again wasn't a very merciful place in fact it had to be a painful place if you were among the most broken seeing one person leave every year out of possibly hundreds who were gathered one person would walk away better than they came one person would receive the healing at Bethesda's pool one person would be transformed in that moment so Bethesda wasn't necessarily a place of mercy and gratitude for most people it was a place of pain and hurt and another year goes by where they did not get what they hoped to receive the scripture says that on this one particular year Jesus shows up to the house of mercy. He comes to Bethesda's pool and possibly found or sought out the person who may have been in the worst situation. It says that when he got there, there was a man who had been there. And Jesus saw the man who had been there for 38 years, it said. 
38 years, and I got to say that again, 38 years of hoping and wishing and praying, 38 years believing somehow that this might be my season. But you know, based on the nature of his affliction, the possibility of him being healed was not really strong because no one was really going to help him. So how was he going to make it? Can you imagine going to the routine of showing up in a place where you think healing is, knowing that you'll never be a recipient of the healing that is present? Constantly showing up year after year, which means that showing up for this man had become a habit, but an empty habit because nothing came from the experience. Year after year, showing up time and time again, being at Bethesda's pool, maybe even trying to get close enough to be healed, but no one is really going to help you in that space because everybody is thinking about themselves. Yes, Bethesda was the house of mercy, but it wasn't very merciful because what was primary on Bethesda's agenda was selfishness. If I get mine, I'm going to get to that place. And Jesus goes to this man and sees him in this condition. And he raises a question, depending on the translation you read. He raises this question. Do you want to be better? Do you want to be made well? Will thou be made whole? Here is Jesus showing up in a space where everybody is broken. And Jesus makes a move to one person and asks the question, do you want to be better than you are right now? Do you want to experience transformation? Do you want your life to be changed? Do you want to be made well? And no, my God, and some of us may resonate with this. The man never says yes or no. The obvious thing would be that when Jesus raises the question that the man would say, yes, if you've been there, if you've been in this afflicted place 38 years, yes, you want to be healed. Yes, you want to be better. Yes, you want to be made whole. Yes, you want to be restored. That's only if you make the assumption that after all these years, three decades, that you have not internalized that wellness is not for you. You see, there's a difference between being broken physically, wounded physically, and being broken in your spirit. When you get to a place where you are so, you so believe in some way that you will not receive the things you want, that you don't know how to answer when the possibility of breakthrough arrives, that you so accepted the condition and the nature of your life and the experience at that point, that you don't really believe that something better can come. You go through the motions just like this man, going through the motions, going through the light, well, saying the right things, saying all the right things that people expect you to say, believing to a degree some of those same things, but not really believing all the way. I know some of us have done that, where you have the right words, the right language, and even the right attitude, but something deep within you is not catching up with what you're saying. You're saying the right things, but you're not really believing for yourself. You're saying the right things, but not really, not really embracing the possibility. My God, when you get down for so long and been down so long, getting up rarely can't cause your mind. When you've been in the space so long, even though you want to be better, you've learned to grow accustomed in the broken space and the broken place. Do you want to be better? He can't answer it yes or no, because if he says yes, then that says that hope is not gone. If he says no, hope is already eradicated. He stays between a yes and a no. But watch what he does, beloved. He doesn't say yes. He doesn't say no. But he does what some of us say after we've internalized the fact that we'll never get better, but keep going through motions to give the appearance of hope. He begins to lament the story of his experience. I come here every year, Jesus. And as soon as the waters get troubled, there's no one to pull me there. I, no one helps me. I, I want to be better, but I don't really have help. He begins to repeat a narrative. I'm sure he's repeated to others. He begins to repeat a familiar narrative of his predicament and his situation, but his repeating of the narrative of his life does not suggest the possibility that he wants to be better. He just repeats it. He laments. He lashes out even at the experience. The water is trouble, but clearly the water ain't for me because I can't get there. He gets to that place where he accepts the condition conditions and the limits placed upon him he has accepted it and has a story to tell why he must remain the way he is I hope you catch that beloved 
when you get to the place in your journey where you stop hoping that things could get better. Have you ever been there in your life? No one likes to be transparent about their hopeless moments. No one wants to be honest about the moments when they have literally, emotionally, spiritually given up. Especially those of us who claim to be believers. No one wants to ever say there are moments where hopelessness and doubt intrude upon your reality because we want to believe. Well, faith ought to overcome all of that. But there are moments when the damage is so deep and the wounds are so deep that it is hard to overcome that sense of hopelessness. Have you ever been there before? Can you be honest enough about it even right now to see that space and to see the man, but not to see the man, but to see those moments in your life where you had accepted this is as far as I could get this is all that I will know and so you almost make peace with your predicament without the possibility of breakthrough you make peace with your predicament without the possibility of breakthrough because you stop believing that that was a possibility for you and sometimes, here's a good thing we do, some folk don't know and don't see when hopelessness has set our agenda. They don't always see it because we've done such a good job camouflaging it, masking it, that they don't see that we've given up. They don't know because we keep on showing up to the right places with the right language, saying the right thing, but we don't always fully believe in the possibility for ourselves. I'm going to ask you again, have you ever been there? Because it's not a good place to be. And oftentimes when you're in that space, you can't share with anybody. You don't want to tell anyone, especially when you've done a good job of committing the, well, you've learned how to disguise things. You've learned how to cover things. I know from my own experience, I suffer from a very rare disease. And in my youthful days, I stopped talking about being in pain. I stopped talking about being hurting because, because I heard this word. I've shared this story before. I heard a word by my school nurse and my mother repeated it called hypochondriac. And I looked it up and I said, that ain't going to be me. And so instead of being honest about my pain, I learned to camouflage it because I didn't want people to call me a name that I didn't believe I was. So I learned to not only camouflage the pain and mask the misery, but I suffered in silence because I didn't want anyone to know what was really happening in my life. I know, I know some of us know that. We get up every day and perform our way through the day. We get up every day and make sure that, that, that everything is intact so that no one can see the chinks in our armor or the gaps in our being or the fault lines in our spirit because we don't want to make it seem as though things are going wrong and hell is breaking loose. I got to let you know, sometimes the vulnerability and transparency is necessary, not even for people, it's for your own mental well-being. That your honesty about your situation and honesty about your condition and honesty about your predicament is the first starting point to your healing. No need to be in denial of it because once you're in denial of where you are and what you're going through, then healing begins to drift further and further away because you're not being honest about the situation. And if you've done this long enough and long enough and long enough and long enough and years pass and years pass, you grow accustomed in your misery. So that one day when someone asks you, do you want to be better? You don't even know how to answer. Do you want to be better? Well, maybe there will come a point, beloved, in your journey. And I don't know where you are, but here's what I will tell you. It will come a point in your journey, especially when, like this man, you've dealt with brokenness, when the time must come, when something must change where something in your life has to change and you must make up in your mind that that time for that transformation is now. That you've been in this space and you've been in these places and you've been dealing with this long enough and it is time now to move from where you are in the direction of your new season. And you got to make up in your mind whatever it takes to get to this new season, you're willing to do it because you've languished on the shores of misery long enough. I cannot stay here. Have you ever said that to yourself? I cannot stay here any longer. I cannot stay in this space any longer. I cannot stay around these people any longer. I cannot stay in this environment any longer. 
dog. You see, it takes courage to get there. That means you're more concerned about your well-being than impressing people who are around. I cannot remain in this space. I cannot be this person anymore. I'm tired of the fraudulence. I'm tired of the camouflaging. I'm tired of the disguise. I'm tired of putting on the mask. I want to be myself. Why? Because I want to make sure when healing shows up, the real me gets healed and not the fake me I've created to please other people. That's when you make up your mind. It's time. To get from here, leave from here. I've been around this mountain long enough. I've been in this point long enough. And here's the really good news. Even when it's time and you don't see it, you missed that. It can be time for transformation, but you don't always see it. Thank God for the right person coming at the right time to remind you that you can't remain in that place. My God, have you ever had those people that have been on divine assignment in your life to break you out of your mournful moments, to break you out of your grieving, to remind you that life has more to offer and that you cannot stay here? I've learned to thank God for those angels who showed up in my life to pull me out of my pity party and tell me that there's more for you on the agenda and you cannot stay here that it seems like at the right time God sends the right person the right people to get your mind right and let you know I may not have all the answers but I need to move in the direction of my healing yes yes oh my god yes because it's not always about moving from here to there sometimes you just got to move in the direction of your healing and see some things begin to happen in your life I thank God at that very moment that Jesus shows up he asks the question and he doesn't wait for an answer. He hears the man giving his story. He heals the man giving his negative narrative. He hears the man pouring out his heart in misery. And Jesus does not respond to the story. He responds to what possibility looks like. Get up from where you are. Take up what you've been carrying and move forward in your life. It is time for your new season to dawn. And the only way you can move into that new season is to seize this opportunity to get up from where you are, rise above the circumstance you're in, and now journey into a new place. Can I give you this? Here's the other thing. Jesus said, rise. That's the first step. Get up. Get up out of the pain and out of the misery and out of the mourning and begin to move in a new direction. But here's the thing. He didn't just say get up and go. He said get up. But by the way, the things that have been carrying you, you now carry it. You missed that. The things that have been holding you, you now hold it. He said take up that bed. Why? Why do I need to take it up, Jesus? I've been delivered from it. I got up from it. No, that bed ain't for you. It's for the folk who knew you. You didn't catch that. Okay. The folk who saw you, the folk who are used to you being down, they need to be reminded that they ain't, ain't the same person you saw before. You understand that some people will misappropriate you when you're no longer in the familiar space that keeps them comfortable? No, nah, y'all didn't get that. That, that. that there's some people who will sit there in a way who will have a problem with the restored you, the healed you, the healthy you, the, 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 the awakened you, that they get so used to you being broken that you become a threat you're healed, that they begin to wonder, is this the same person? You got to tell them, yes it is, but I'm no longer limping along, I'm no longer being carried, I am carrying the very thing I've been depending on, because it no longer has that power. Oh, is there anybody in here today who can testify that you've gotten to that point in your life where you're ready to move in a new direction, and you're no longer going to be carried by circumstances or people or situations, but you are now going to move forward and Jesus said rise take up your bed and walk man I would have been like Jesus I'm ready to run no 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 walk and be deliberate in your footsteps so that everybody who thought you were going to remain where you were can see it is you yes it is me go into some of the same spaces with a new countenance and a new framework and a new possibility and let them know if it had not been for god on my side i would have lost my mind a lot is anybody here who can testify that if it had not been for the Lord restoring me and keeping me and lifting me and reminding me of how amazing I am. I would have given up. He said, rise, take up your bed and walk because it's time for your new day. It's time for your new season. It's time 
for your new life. And here's what I love. I'm glad that that time ain't dependent on my time. Because if that time is dependent on my time, I would always be off time. You didn't catch that. If that time of healing was dependent on my time of complacency with my misery, I would always be off time. But I'm so glad that God doesn't move on my time. Can you imagine what your life would look like if God said, I'll heal you, but when you're ready? No, no, there are moments where God is going to tell you, you, you may not be ready, but it's time because you've been here long enough. You have overstayed this place. You have been in this space too long. And, and, and now in order to go to the next place, you got to get up from where you are and start walking in the direction of your new day. It's time. Somebody in here knows it's time. It is time. It is time. And here's, and here's what you got to also remember. Not only is it time, but look at the story of the man. Here he is walking, walking. And the people see him, the religious leaders and the writer of John made sure to add this to it. And it was the Sabbath. What does that mean? It was a day when none of this should have been happening. No healing, no carrying the mat, no nothing. But can you imagine when that time is at odds with what in the Message Bible are the rules? I am so grateful that God doesn't even play by the rules that God may establish all the time. Because God is the only one who can break those the Sabbath was established. But what does the Sabbath mean? Hold on. If the Sabbath is about rest, then that means that it was the best time to be healed. Because that man, after 38 years, needed rest from what he had been dealing with. That was Sabbath embodied. They were angry that he did it then, and, and they asked, who was it who did it? And this is just for extra today. Here's what the man said. For those who lack, well, for those of us who are supremely gifted but lack humility at the right time. The man said, I don't know who it was. Hear that. The message bound said, Jesus just slipped away. Didn't need any credit. They didn't need to be seen. They didn't need to be publicly validated or affirmed. Because why would you need to be publicly validated or affirmed when you're convinced about who you are already? He just slips away and doesn't need credit. And all that's left is not the healer, but the evidence of healing. It's time, beloved. And somebody in here today needs to hear that. It's time. It's that beautiful line that God tells Israel as they were going through the wilderness for 40 years and they were around the mountain. He said, you've been around this mountain long enough. It's time to break camp and go from here. Maybe you've been around that emotional mountain long enough. And it's time. It's time. Do me a favor, beloved. Stand on your feet for a second. And I want us to pray today. And if you feel led, I want you to come down for prayer today because, because there may be somebody here today, watch this, where it has been past time. I want you to come up today. Come on down. If you know that this spoke to you because you have been past time for this new season, this new day, for your awakening, your breakthrough. Because here's the next thing. You may recognize it's past time, but the real question is, are you ready for what God is about to do in your life? But you got to make up in your mind, just like this song, it is my season. It is my season of favor and breakthrough. You have to feel that in your very spirit today. 
And so you keep on coming and don't hesitate today if you know that you are past time and now is the right time to begin to move in the direction of your healing and more than that, your new season.